Remember back in the day when people told you that playing video games was a waste of time? Well, this is Team Liquid, right after they won over $10 million at the International Dota 2 Tournament Grand Finals. Gaming went from a hobby to a legitimate career. As you can see from the top gamers, there are those who are making more than most people with a college degree for video games. Prize money is a great source of income, but with the growing popularity of Twitch, gamers have the opportunity to get paid while streaming their favorite games. Summit 1G gets massive donations while playing. Fallen is not only on one of the top teams and makes a ton of money from tournaments, but he also makes money streaming and he has various brand deals. Then you got guys like Dr. Disrespect. He's not only a good gamer, but he's grown based on the character that he plays on camera. But this isn't a success story. This is a story about how addiction destroyed my professional gaming career. What's up everybody? This is Chris from The Rewired Soul, where we talk about the problem, but focus on the solution. And this is a story that I don't share too often, even when I share my story of addiction and recovery, I just kind of leave it out. And I don't know why, because gaming is kind of a big deal these days. So kick back, relax. This video is gonna be a little bit longer, but I wanna to explain to you how I actually had a professional gaming career and my addiction completely destroyed it. So the first thing I wanna do when I start off this video, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, some people that I hurt and harmed and things like that. And if any of them are watching, some of them I still have on Facebook, and if you happen to stumble across this, in any way, I want you to know that I'm truly sorry. I was a selfish, self-centered, egotistical asshole, all right? And I do apologize. But I have, um, you know, grown some of these relationships back and things like that. Uh, but for anybody else who I hurt in the past, I am truly sorry, all right? So as some of you know who follow my channel, you know that I am a drug addict and alcoholic in recovery and something I want to point out as you see how this story goes my addiction for me personally the way my addiction manifests it is almost 1000% based on my pride and based on my ego and you will see how that played its role in me destroying my professional gaming career my addiction was only a, a symptom of the issue, but my pride and my ego is what led me to drink and use more drugs, all right? So I want you to remember that as we go along. So anyways, since a young age, young, young age, I was born in 1985, the year the Nintendo came out. I was probably four or five years old when I got my first Nintendo gaming system, and I was hooked on video games ever since. You know, I grew up playing Nintendo, then I switched over to Sega, then I got myself a PlayStation, and just onward and upward. It was around high school when I really got into PC gaming. I got my first computer, I was hanging out with a friend, and he was like, yo, let's check out this game. I think it was StarCraft, the first StarCraft, and I sucked, but I loved it, I loved it. And we played the original Warcraft. Um, something about me, I'm very competitive. Like, not in a, in a crazy way, it used to be in a crazy way, but not anymore, but I'm very competitive. And, you know, in high school I was a triathlete, I did football, wrestling, and track, but gaming was another way for me to be competitive. And a lot of this played into being the child of an alcoholic mom and not feeling like I got attention, not feeling that I was good enough. Like competition gave me a way to prove to myself and to prove to other people that I was actually good at something, whether it was real life sports or whether it was esports. So I remember having my friends come over, um, bringing over their PlayStations and you had to use that link cable and two separate TVs. Like this is like pre high speed internet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> all you kids out there. And that's what we did. I remember playing the first or second Warcraft on 56K dial-up with my friends, right? But with broadband internet coming out and my friend introducing me to some games on the computer, I ended up getting a computer and my dad made a deal with me. He said, we can get high-speed internet if I joined the wrestling team, if I just tried it, right? And that's how I joined the wrestling team. And I was like, no, that's lame. You gotta wear like these tights and you gotta wrestle around with dudes. But I was a natural and I actually excelled like, crazy in wrestling. We ended up going to the state championships. I ended up getting a nice little ring, which I lost in my addiction, oh well. But anyways, throughout that time, 
I was a hardcore gamer. Um, the first first person shooter that I really got into was Quake 3. Loved it, loved it. I could play that all day long. And what's crazy is, is that, you know, with all of my anxiety and depression that I struggled with throughout high school, gaming was actually the reason why I didn't start drinking until the very end of my high school career. I remember every Friday night we had our varsity football games and we'd play and then everybody would go out and party and they'd invite me and my buddy um, and we'd be like, no, no thanks. And we would just go and play video games. This was when land centers were on the rise, um, gaming cafes, if you will, and we would just go hang out there and we'd play. And then I was introduced to my first addiction, which was a game called Counter-Strike. Boy, did I fall in love with that game. Like, I think it's also important for um, people with addictions to realize that we were often addicts long before drugs and alcohol came into play. And what I mean by that is when I got hooked on Counter-Strike, I had an obsession. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I would stay up until two or three in the morning playing. Me and my buddy would ditch class to go home and play Counter-Strike. Like, we were obsessed with this game. But anyways, my junior and senior year, as I'm playing Counter-Strike, um, and I was really into the competitive aspect, one of the land centers here, it had a local league, and we were we were one of the best teams in Vegas. We were always within the top three, me and my friends. And I was just, I loved the competition of it. And around that time, we started watching um, international tournaments. The tournament to watch back in the day, and some of you old schoolers, you know what I'm talking about. It was called CPL. It was like called, I think it stood for the Cyber Athlete Professional League. And every year they would have two tournaments uh, in Dallas, one in the summer, one in the winter. And then other tournaments started to spawn in other countries and things like that. And what we used to do back in the day, me and my buddies would all go over to my friend's house. He was freaking rich and we'd all bring our computers over and we'd stay up all night just watching these tournaments, like whether they were here in the States or they were in other countries. And I will never forget, I'll never forget. I remember watching one of these tournaments in another country and I was like, man, I would love to travel the world, see the world, do something that people don't even get a chance to do, right? I would love to do that for video games. And another thing about us addicts and alcoholics is that when we set our mind on something, like we go get it. Unfortunately, that's typically with drugs and alcohol. But anyways, I locked in on that. I was like, I want to do that. So right after high school, I ended up going to a small, tiny, tiny college in Northern California. And there was a website called Got Frag. And they were a website covering all of the major Counter-Strike tournaments. They were doing feature articles and things like that. And I kind of realized, like, I humbled myself and I was like, okay, Chris, you're never gonna become a professional gamer, but I was always known as one of the smartest guys in the game. So I wanted to sign up and start writing for free for this place, uh, this website called Got Frag. I wanted to do that and work my way up the ranks and become known. and go to tournaments, you know, because I figured I couldn't make it as a player. So, and it, it's an interesting story too. So I ended up weaseling my way in because I used to make Counter-Strike movies and they needed people to, um, who were video editors. And I'm like, yeah, sure, sign me up. So I did that and I was, I'm one of those guys, I still am, where if something needs to be done, I volunteer. I just wanna do it, I just wanna do it. I like work, I like working hard, I like um, impressing bosses, you know, and all that stuff. So they ended up needing graphic design done. So I started doing that, even though my stuff sucked. But I was really into Photoshop back in the day, so I made some stuff. Well, anyways, CPL had a league, an online league called Cal, okay? Cyber Athlete Amateur League, I think it was. And every week they would do predictions, okay? And whenever they did predictions, I remember watching and reading these articles and the guy who did predictions sucked, right? Like he was just, he was just really half-assing it. Okay, and I was looking at him like, man, I could do such a better job. And I was always asking like, can I write something? Can I do something? Can I do some predictions? Because I like really watch these teams. Like while some people like are really into like football or hockey or baseball and they know every single player and they know how this team operates and how that team operates and how the matchup's gonna be like, that's how I was with Counter-Strike. Well, lo and behold, one day this dude's computer got a virus and he could not do the predictions. And we were talking back in MIRC C chat and they're like, we need somebody to do the predictions. And I'm like, mm, mm, pick me, pick me. So I ended up doing the predictions that week 
And everybody who read my predictions loved it. They absolutely loved it. And they're like, this guy needs to do more of them. And by the way, my gaming name is Bootman, so you might hear that throughout this video. So everybody's like, this guy needs to do them from now on, right? So what they started to do, they started letting me and the other guy do predictions together. Eventually that guy just left, I kept doing predictions, but now I had my foot in the door and I wanted to do more. I wanted to write about my thoughts about Counter-Strike strategy and different players and player moves and you know um, player trades and gossip in the community. I just wanted to do more and get really involved and I started doing it. And it, it exploded with this one thing. So the guy I looked up to, and he's one of the guys, if he watches this, I would like to apologize, um, Trevor Midway Schmidt. So if any of you are old school gamers, like he he's still in the, in the scene, but he's more in the background, but he was the dude. He went from being a pro gamer to running Gottfrag. He was one of the, the first guy, one of the main guys who started Gottfrag. And he was, he was like a mentor, a big brother to me, helped me out a lot. But anyways, he did an article um, around big tournaments called Midway's Playbook. And I loved him. I loved what he did. But something that I do, I'm, I'm always thinking outside of the box. That's why you see a bunch of different content on my channel. I'm always trying to think outside of the box. And I was looking at what Midway was doing and I absolutely loved it. And I was like, you know what? I think we could do more with this. I think we could do more with this. I, in my brain, I always related Counter-Strike to football, right? It's very similar. Football, you do a play, you stop, you regroup, you come back. Same thing with Counter-Strike. You, you play around, you stop, you regroup, you come back, right? And I was like, okay, well, if it's kind of like football, then maybe we can start analyzing the offense and defense. Maybe we can start predicting what the other teams are doing. So I talked them into letting me do a guest playbook and Trevor's articles, Midway's articles, his playbooks, they were about a page or two pages long. They were great, they were great articles, right? But I ended up taking about, man, I don't know, like eight, eight hours, 12 hours, and I did this extremely in-depth playbook. There was a team that was on the rise at the time called NOA. It was the first time that um, international players and North American players merged together and made a team. So NOA stood for, you know, it was like North America as well as, I forget. But anyways, they were like, uh, they were from uh, the Nordic countries. So like, um, like uh, Norway and Sweden and stuff like that. But anyways, they were on the rise. And then they were my first playbook. I did this really in-depth one. And I've really focused on the defense. And back in the day, so any of you CSGO players, and I think you can still kind of shoot through walls in CSGO, but back in the day in CS 1.6, you can straight up shoot through a wall like it was paper. So what I did was I was watching demos of these teams and just watching and I would find each of the players' favorite spots on NOA and I released this massive playbook, this massive playbook. All right, and because I did that, Gottfrag actually flew me out to Dallas to the CPL, and it was right after I launched this playbook, and something insane happened. You just saw that teams were destroying NOA. They were shooting these guys straight through walls because my playbooks were on point. They knew exactly where these people were going to be. And I remember, because I was kind of friends with some of the, um, the, the guys on NOA and they were like, they were like upset, but like in a joking way, like it was, and I was like, oh my God, like I really hit something. And that's when I exploded. That's when I became a big deal. People were like, Bootman's playbooks, Bootman's playbooks, Bootman's playbooks. And I started writing a lot more, writing a lot more, just so many more things. And I was just hooked on that. I was, so I was working a regular nine to five job and I would come home and just write and write and write. Like this was gonna be my ticket. And I kept doing that and eventually got Frag flew me out to Sweden to go to something called the Nolova Land. So I was about 19 years old, I think, and I just got a 100% paid for trip to another country and it was a dream come true. And right about this time, okay, my drinking wasn't terrible, okay? I started off with just alcohol, no drugs at all. And it wasn't terrible, but I liked to party. I loved to party. I, I had that kind of frat guy mentality, even though I wasn't in a fraternity. So, you know, that international flight, I got to drink. I got to drink when I went there. 
it was still somewhat under control. What ended up happening was there was a team called Team 3D, okay? And Team 3D came to me and they said, listen, we love your playbooks. We need some help because 3D used to be the top North American team. There just used to be this rivalry between North America and Sweden. And they're like, look, we want to hire you to make us like personal playbooks for the other teams. And they were going to WCG in San Francisco. I forget what year it is. It might have been 2006. And they said, we want to pay you to do it. And I think they wanted to pay me like 500 bucks. And I went to my bosses at Gotfrag. I'm like, yo, can I do this? And they ended up letting me do it. And I was like, okay, so, <laughs> so I did this really in-depth playbook. It was kind of hard because there's so many teams at that tournament and you don't know who they're gonna play. So I think I did like the top teams. And uh, my roommate, one of my best friends in the world, his name is Weenus. So he, he kind of, uh, he started growing as a name in Gotfrag too. I hooked him up with a writing gig and he got bigger and bigger too. But Weenus back in the day, he used to work at Office Max. So I, I had him print out this playbook like these used to just be online and they printed it out put the little spiral thing like I was being all professional and I ended up going to WCG in San Francisco and I gave 3D this playbook and for the first time the first time in I think a year or two and in gaming time that's a long time for North America to win a championship team 3D ended up winning the world championship they took down SK who was the top Swedish team at the time that people thought were invincible and now I'm sitting there like oh my god like I can actually like help teams like in a new way now now I know like it it was it was very I don't even know the words to explain it. It was it was amazing seeing that what my work can do, what this effort I was putting in can do. And at that time, by the way, back then, back in my day, there was no coaches. There was no coaches in the scene. Now, I'm gonna let you in on a secret. If you're still in here with this story, I ended up becoming the first esports coach in the world. All right. And some of you are going to say, no, you weren't. What about that guy Veslin and, you know, these other people um, back then? A lot of people were getting hired and getting the name coach. Right. But they were basically just somebody. They were like a hype man. They would stand behind the team and just hype them up and say, come on. Yeah, let's do it. Right. That's what they would do. They weren't they weren't actually coaching. So. I made one of the hardest decisions I had to make in my life, which was leaving Gottfrag and becoming the coach of Team 3D. But I wanted to do it. I wanted to be the first coach. I wanted my name to be somewhere. And I think maybe my ego is playing a little part in the reason why I'm making this video. Nobody talks about me. And maybe it's because of the relationships I, I destroyed. So I accept that. I accept that and I move forward. But nobody talks about how Bootman was the first real coach in esports. Now, when you see these professional gaming tur tournaments across all the different games, you see that all of them have coaches, right? And legitimate coaches. So Team 3D hired me. My drinking was escalating a bit. But let me dial back a little bit. Back before I left Gottfrag, this is when my ego really started to take a turn for the worse. And this is when alcoholism was actually starting to cause a problem. When I was with Gottfrag and we were in Dallas, so keep in mind, this is when I was 19, 20 years old. I was not of age to drink. And I would sneak into parties. I would find alcohol. I would have other people, you know, um, buy me alcohol. And it was kind of normal. Like all of us were like right around that age, 19, 20. Like if you were 21, you were already like a geezer. So there was a lot of underage drinking back in the day. And what ended up happening was I ended up going to this party with an open bar and just getting completely plastered. And we went over to one of the team's rooms. I forgot what team it was, but back in the day, there was a girl, one of the player's girlfriends, and her whole shtick back then was to talk about gaming gossip. And we went into that room. I didn't even notice she was in there. She was wearing a wig. It was weird. And she ended up recording me coming in there drunk. And she caught me on camera saying, well, look at me. I'm 18 and I'm drunk or however old I was. And she had that on film. And Got Frag came, came to my aid and they, <laughs> they ended up getting her to not release that, get rid of it and sweep it under the rug. And I hope I'm not like making Got Frag look bad. 
bad. But anyways, like it was it was it was a bad situation all around. But I put myself in danger, my career in danger at that point. But anyways, I started having a lot of problems with my bosses. Like these guys, like I had absolutely no humility at all. No humility. As I was rising and I was becoming a big deal, you know, I my brain was telling me like Gottfrag would be nothing without me. You wouldn't get you wouldn't get the traffic without me. You wouldn't get the sponsors without me. You wouldn't get the ads without me. Nobody would come to this crap hole website if it wasn't for me, the boot man, right? And I would say this to the bosses. I used to have insane anger issues. So when I was like just like this big whiny baby baby and like whenever I didn't get my way I would just throw this tantrum and I would fight with them and you know one of the heads of Godfrag he used to talk to me for hours and talk me off these cliffs when I wanted to quit because nobody respected me and just all this stuff and to be honest that was one of the reasons I ended up taking the job with 3D um, and it was completely based on my pride and ego and when I started working with 3D, um, CPL started something, the CPL World Tour. And basically, they were popping up every every month or every other month. They were popping up in different countries and having these tournaments. And Team 3D kept getting invited to them. So at this time, I'm getting flown all over the country. I used to go to New York once a month to um, be with the team. Um, we would all fly out there. And then right before we went to Spain, so I got to go to, first I went to Sweden, then I went to Barcelona, Spain. And we went there. But first we met up in, uh, I think it was Virginia, and we did like this boot camp. So as a coach, while they were practicing and doing uh, scrimmages online and stuff, like I was over there analyzing teams, making playbooks and things like that. So we end up going to Spain to the world tour and we got demolished. This is back when Team Complexity, um, who was another North American team, great, great guys. A lot of them were good friends. Here's actually a picture of me with uh, one of the guys who was on the old Complexity team, Trip, and then as well as uh, my buddy Josh, Dominator Seavers. And so we went out there, we ended up getting destroyed, but when I would go out of the country, like my drinking would just go insane. Like the entire time on the plane, I was getting plastered. Because as soon as I would hit international waters, now it was time for me to drink. And I would just get wasted on the flight. And when we got to Spain, I immediately hit the bar. And this is one of those things like, I would go to another country and I would spend more time drinking than actually like exploring and sightseeing and stuff like that. Most of the nights while we were in Spain, I was just, you know, we would leave the tournament and I would just go find a bottle. I would go buy some booze and just get blackout drunk in my hotel room. But like, to me, it was like, oh, we're just partying because we're out of the country. But like, while my my teammates, the guys on my team and other gamers, they were just like kind of relaxing, chilling, having some drinks. Like, I was just like, I want to get blackout drunk, you know? And... After that, we ended up going to another WCG event, which was in Paris, France. So now I get to go to Paris, France. And this is a story that I look back on and I'm just like, man, like if that's not somebody who's addicted to alcohol, I don't know who is. So we went to France and again, just buying all the booze I can. And I remember, I remember people kept going, like when it wasn't time for the tournament, they would go to the Eiffel Tower and see these amazing places in Paris, France. And I remember thinking this thought. I remember wanting to drink instead. I wanted to just get wasted. When we had free time, I just wanted to get blackout wasted. And my brain told me, I said, don't worry, Chris, you can see the Eiffel Tower the next time in your par you're in Paris. Like, what? What? Like, spoiler alert, it's been, what is it, 2018? It's been over a decade now. I still haven't been back to Paris. So that's to show you where my priorities were. Rather than going to see the Eiffel Tower, I decided to get wasted instead, right? And fortunate enough for me, the tournament was actually inside the Louvre, um, which is a famous museum in case you didn't know. And so I got to see that just by going to the tournament. But um, fun fact about that tournament, we were the first team to tie every single one of our group stages stage matches like in the, in the history at that point i don't know if it's happened again but yeah anyways uh here's here's another picture of me we were doing a, a kind of like a uh, after match press conference um with the media like 
back then, like people were having me sign autographs and um, here's, here's a screenshot and you can't see it, but we were sponsored by NVIDIA and I was on this, like this was just building my ego and building my ego. Like when, when random people are coming up to you and having you sign stuff and you're getting put on boxes and I remember signing posters for giveaways that we were doing and stuff, like my ego was just out of control. And the problem was too is that coaching them became difficult. It was difficult for me to coach these guys when they're like these big deals, like they're the famous ones. Like we're talking about guys and these might be names you don't remember, but all of you old schoolers do. We're talking about like K-Sharp, Rambo, Bombs, Moto, right? These were big deals and they wouldn't listen to me. And I didn't know how to keep them in check. You know what I mean? And there ended up being some uh, some shakeups with our roster around that time. 3D went through quite a few shakeups. But anyways, what ended up happening was we actually recruited two guys from that team in OA that I originally playbooked. And these were two friends of mine, right? Mikey So and Griffin Banger, also known as Method and Shagwire, okay? And this is when it took a turn for the worse and my ego got out of control and I was drinking. And one thing about drinking is it makes you depressed when you are when you become an alcoholic and you become completely delusional. And I just started butting heads with these guys. And it's really sad too. So Mikey, Griffin, if you're watching this, again, I apologize. Like here's a, here's a picture of me and Griffin. Like Griffin was like one of my favorite dudes in the world. I still love that guy. Like um, for those of you who don't know, like, he was Shagwire back in the day, but now he's Griffin, the professional poker player. Like, he actually made it to the final table at the World Series of Poker. Um, was it last year or two years ago? But anyways, here's a clip of him at the final table. And he's like a big deal in the poker world. Like, I, I, I have much respect for this dude. Like, he's just one of those guys where, you know, when he finds something, like, he gets really into it. So I'm glad that he's still doing great. But anyways... I ended up leaving the team, just leaving the team, and then I went back to Godfrag with my tails between my legs, begging them to take me back, and I even cut them a deal. I said, listen, if you guys take me back, you don't have to fly me anywhere. I just wanna, basically, I just wanna still be relevant. Just let me write again and da-da-da-da-da, right? And man, it took maybe a couple months for my ego to just go crazy out of control again. And this is right around the time when Gottfried was just getting huge. They gave me a second chance and I blew it. And my drinking was just off the rails at that point. I'm talking every night, blackout drunk, hungover, still drunk the next day, terrible. I could barely even write. Like, I don't know what I was even doing back then, but anyways, I was yelling at them, how come you don't fly me anywhere? I'm, I'm always comparing myself to the other staff members and stuff like that, and I ended up quitting. And that was, that was pretty much the end of it. And, you know, it was one of the biggest regrets when I first got clean, and not even when I first got clean, man, like, during my active addiction, like, it's one of the things that fueled my addiction. I was so depressed. I hated myself for what I did. I hated myself because I fell out of the scene and not long after that, got fragged, got bought out by MLG for millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Like millions of dollars. And I didn't see a penny of it, okay? Um, looking back, I don't know if I would have. I wasn't like a stakeholder or anything, but the guys at Gottfrag were amazing and I'm sure they would have hooked me up or helped me out. But, you know, I was on this path to making this what I do with my life, just being involved in video games. Like, being involved with video games would have been part of my life. But instead, I chose to just keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. And I just fell out of the scene. And meanwhile, my buddy Weenus, he ended up doing great things. He helped him out, uh, helped Godfrag out with a magazine they launched real quick. He ended up getting a job with um, Team EG back in the day. Um, he also became a big deal at CGS. So back, oh man, this was about 
10 years ago, DirecTV started a league called CGS and they, they, they sent everybody out to Los Angeles, uh, well, in the Los Angeles area, and the, the players lived there, and it was a weekly televised thing. There was Counter-Strike, there was FIFA, there was Dead or Alive, and there was a Forza, I think it was, right? And Bobby ended up getting me a job with them. I ended up writing for um, one of the teams called the Las Vegas Venom. And at that time, I was unemployed, my drinking was insane, and I got to go out there for a little while, and I remember just begging people to buy me alcohol, like, man, like, that's not a good look, y'all. Like, I was begging the players, I was begging my boss, um, Alex Conroy, also known as Jax, who was a big deal back in the gaming days and stuff like that, so Alex, if you're watching this, like, I remember one night, the my paycheck was like late and I remember begging Alex because me and him we were staying in the same apartment um and I was begging him for booze money begging him like how pathetic but that's what that's what us alcoholics and drug addicts do and like it was just terrible and anyways I ended up you know um walking away from that not long after it like shut down anyways out of nowhere but you know i i would beat myself up in my in my addiction as well as my early recovery because i sit back and i still love i still love gaming i still love gaming so much um and i sit back and i would watch it and all these guys all these guys were just going somewhere they were going somewhere they were making tens of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, guys I used to hang out with and be friends with, and I'm just sitting there. It's like that, you know, it's like that, uh, that, that, that football player, like I could have been somebody, I could have been something like that was me when it came to gaming and it fueled my depression and my self pity and things like that. And I, I just, I couldn't believe what I did. But anyways, throughout my recovery, I, I found this new purpose. I found this new purpose of one, first and foremost, just being a father to my kid, but also helping other people recover from addiction. And that's one of the reasons why I'm sharing this story with you. Um, we're taught to share our experience, strength, and hope. What, what happened and how I got through it and where I'm at now. And, you know, I'm... I'm glad that, you know, so many of the guys that I used to be friends with who are succeeding in esports and, you know, they're able to support their families. Like back then, like none of us had kids, none of like none of that stuff. And like now we got families and, you know, my buddies are getting married and things like that. And I'm glad that gaming is something that they're still doing that completely supports them. I'm no longer a hater. I'm no longer sitting around miserable. Like I'm like, awesome, man. You know, in my recovery in the past two or, two or three years, I've actually had a chance to run into them quite a few times. Um, we went to the Intel Extreme Masters Tournament up in San Jose a couple years ago, bumped into a bunch of old friends and talked to them and things like that. Um, last year, um, I've always wanted to go to Seattle, so I actually got to go to uh, TI6. Amazing experience. I'm a big Dota 2 nerd and player, and I'm, I still play a lot of video games, by the way. Uh, but I got to go there um, with my friends, and it was, it was an amazing experience. It just gets me ramped up about esports again. Over the past couple of years, I've, I've dipped my toe back into the esports thing a little bit, but I, I finally realized that this, what I'm doing right now with you is just, this is my true passion. This is my new passion, and this is what I love doing now. I, I found every time that I tried to get back into esports, because I still, I didn't burn every single bridge and I still had some opportunities and I, I'm pretty sure even if I just shut down the rewired soul right now like I can work my butt off and get back into it but this helping people like you with your mental health addiction recovery whatever the case may be like that is my true passion now but one of the things that I get to do now is that I get to do gaming with my son I get to play with him, I get to tell him these stories, I get to be the parent who encourages him, like, do what you love, like, we live in an amazing time, that's something that, that helps me get out of depression, by the way, is just knowing that, like, we, this isn't something you could do 50, 60 years ago, and not just for gaming, if for some reason you're still with me watching this, this isn't just for gaming, like, you can literally, like, anything that you're passionate about, you can turn it into a career, you can turn it into something that pays the bills, and I like being able to teach that to my son and say, look, dude, if you love gaming, like just get good at it. 
You have to have the work ethic, you have to practice, you have to do the deal, and this can become a career. But if he doesn't want to, he also wants to be a marine biologist, but hey, maybe he'll be the first professional gamer marine biologist. Um, but yeah, I've been able to take him to some gaming tournaments since we live in Las Vegas. I've been able to take him to some tournaments. Um, we went to a Heroes of the Storm tournament. Um, we went to the Evo tournament, which is console fighting games. Um, he didn't come with me to the mo uh, one of the most recent ones, but DreamHack came to Las Vegas. I got to go there. Again, I got to see some of my old friends. Um, I also ran into my buddy Hedon. You don't believe that I knew Hedon? Well, check this picture out. But anyways, Hedon, he used to be on SK, big deal. Um, but yeah, I still stay in touch with some of the people, but now I'm a more casual gamer. I'm not a crazy competitive one. Sometimes my uh, competitiveness comes out when me and my son are playing, but I try to, I try to, turn it down a bit, you know what I mean? Uh, my girlfriend calls me out on it all the time, but it's cool, it's something that I get to do now and have fun and do with my son. I, I still stay involved, I'm still kind of watching in the background, seeing where esports is going. CSGO is a thing, I play I played it for, I go off and on on you know CSGO, I don't like it, I'm a 1.6 guy, and one of the reasons I don't like it, let's be real, I suck at it, you know? Um, but uh, you know, all of my friends, I still have a bunch of people in Las Vegas a lot of my friends who I grew up with, we're all still 30 plus year old gaming nerds and we play together. I play Dota 2 with them. We've played Overwatch and things like that. But one of the best things that I've done is, is that, you know, uh, start a YouTube channel with my son. By the way, if any of you want to check it out, I will link to it in the end screen as well as in the info card. Me and my son started a channel called Dilly and Dad, and we do gaming videos on there, and I love playing video games with him. And he hasn't got into the competitive aspect of it, but he will now, but if he wants to. But anyways, like uh, I, I hope you I hope you enjoyed this story. Um, you might be new to my channel. If you are, welcome. Um, but yeah, if you like this video, do me a favor. Give this thing a big thumbs up and do me another favor. Go tell that guy Thorin that he needs to do a video about the first ever esports coach in the world. I'm just kidding. That's my ego talking again. But anyways, uh, I'm glad you stuck around this long. Thanks so much for watching. And you know what? Here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. If you happen to watch this video, if you wanna learn more about addiction, I work at a drug and alcohol treatment center now. I have a website where I put up one of the courses where I teach about the disease of addiction and how it actually works. And if you watch this video, you made it this far, go over to www.therewiredsoul.com, go to the science of the addict of uh, the science of addiction course and it's usually a hundred dollars use coupon code it's free i-t-s-f-r-e-e -E. i'll have it right here so if you want to learn more about addiction there's your free code go check it out but anyways again thank you so much for watching please don't do what i did if you're a kid watching this video and you aspire to be a gamer like Keep your eye on the prize, yo, because you can do it. You can develop a career in this thing. You can take this thing places, all right? So if you're new here and you haven't yet, hit this little round subscribe button because my channel, I'm making all sorts of videos about addiction recovery. I'm also making a ton of videos about how to help you without anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental illness. If you wanna check out some other videos or subscribe to me and my son's channel, click or tap on the subscribe button or the thumbnail right below it, all right? But again, this is Chris from The Rewired Soul. I'll see you next time.